Okay, so my name is Gio. Welcome back to the weekly podcast where I trick professionals into giving up their secrets to us young creatives. Today, let's talk film. We spoke to Taylor Richard, the founder of Third Fathom Films. He was an associate producer in an Academy winning show, HBO's Murder on a Sunday Morning, and just released his horror film, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Let's talk to this guy. We know how fucking tough it is to be a film student. If you want to make money, you want to see how it's done. Taylor's got some tips for us. Let's check it out. And hit it. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. And uh, so I'm going to actually jump right in. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. We're just going to have a cool ass conversation. Cool. Hey, cool. I'm cool. <laughs> Let's do it, man. So. Honestly, 2019, 2020, huge year for you, right? Mm -hmm. Hallowed Be Thy Name coming out um, and everything right. that you were doing. Yeah. And um, I wanted to start off talking about why you chose to film in Georgia because w the film was predominantly shot in and around Georgia, right? Yes. Okay. Is there, because as creative students and everyone, we always hear like, oh, Atlanta's the place to go right now. You know, mm -hmm. the film industry is in Atlanta. Um, is that why you chose to do Georgia? Is it because you just live here? Um, I, because I live here, but because this is such a, um, exciting, um, new thing for Atlanta, for Georgia, um, making films here, uh, it's a new thing. It's not Hollywood. So there's a fresh, pr fresh perspective. People are very excited to work with you. And mm -hmm. so getting films done here outside of the tax credit is just easier. Um, there's a better buy-in, you know, they, people aren't burnt out on film as they are in some of the other places that are used to having it more. So it's been very welcoming and so that's why we chose to do this and so while you're doing the production of this whole thing and you mentioned it was a small crew right for hallow be thy name um remind me again it was what 25 people yeah 25 27 between that cool so in this group of like 25 people in pre covid 19 era like what a dream man um you went around Georgia and you, did you think it was just easier to like get the right locations there's more incentives uh the permits were longer is it everything like that yeah, it just was cheaper um, because there's a lot of locations and a lot of people that we were able to talk to who were so ex excited about working on the project. Um, they gave us a lot of freebies. Um, we were able to leverage relationships. I've been here 15 years, so I was able to leverage relationships with people that I had been cultivating for, you know, my time since I've been here. Um, right. It made it, it made it a lot easier as opposed to me going to an unknown place and having to network and try to build that relationship and that trust that I already have built in here. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. I think that's one of the most important things. Um, I think our kids, notoriously, we have this kind of like stereotype that like we're very artistic, so we don't know how to like have conversations or be social and stuff like that right um, obviously for you not the case for myself i'm doing a podcast so like it's like some people can um but you you mentioned like knowing people having that network so do you think that uh networking and being able to contact people and building this connection hub that's just as important as making the movie well yeah it's that's probably more important you know all great films um are successful or they fail in pre-production and so if you don't have the business acumen or you know, understand the business of making music making movies or anything that's dealing in entertainment you're kind of going to set yourself up for a very hard road and so networking and building relationships and understanding um the dichotomy between people and how things work and you know who you can lean on to get some things done um at low cost part of being a uh, successful in Hallow B is that my producing background is very strong. And so I've been able to leverage these, you know, years and years of, of uh, relationships that I've built since I've done my first feature film, The Final Project, um, mm -hmm. to get Hallow B done. It was, it, it really was um, a cakewalk. And I don't say that lightly. Because <laughs> you self-distribute, right? You and um, Third Fathom. So no, um, my movie was bought by Gravitas Ventures out of oh, LA. Wow. Yeah, so the first film went through Cavo Pictures out of New York, um, and the second film is by Gravitas Ventures out of L.A. Um, but what has happened with me learning distribution from those powerful companies and learning and building relationships with some of the vendors that they use and kind of indoctrinating in that now I am able 
to offer a distribution for other indie films and other projects um, as we're getting ready to release our first Spanish speaking film um, in September, October. Uh, Verano No Miente, uh, Summer Doesn't Lie, uh, by uh, Ernesto Sebastian out of Ecuador. So my company is going to release his film um, later this year. So to actually, tell me a little bit more about this. How did you get to the point where you wanted to distribute a Spanish-speaking film? So a couple of years ago, I, I got an award called uh, the Spotlight Award, and I met this awesome filmmaker, Ernesto Sebastian, and he has the company called uh, The Fifth Machine. Um, I won't try to say it in Spanish because I always mess it up. But he has a company <laughs> called The Fit Machine, and uh, they make awesome films. They do a lot of sci-fi, drama, and those kinds of things. And so what we've been working on here, um, you know, lightly at Third Fathom and then my distribution company that we launched earlier this year, we've been working on building bridges for all minorities um, to help us uh, – you know, get the stories we want to tell out in our own voices, uh, bringing the Hollywood engine here into Atlanta. And so this is our first pro international project that we're going to release. Uh, they're based in Ecuador and um, they're wickedly talented and we're very excited to put our engine behind their work. See, that that's one of the most important parts, um, which is the, the people helping, actively helping other independent filmmakers who are not in the States. Because, I mean, I, I'm super privileged to be in the States, man. It's not easy. Um, as an international kid to, to not even just like the money, but it's just a huge culture shock, right? Um, so to know that there's somebody out there that's using their talent to help up these guys in South America mm -hmm. and is this potentially something you're going to spread to the rest of the, the planet eventually or so what's interesting is that now with uh, so what has happened is third fathom because kind of give you a little breakdown because it's the first time i'm sharing this mm -hmm. so a few years ago a few uh months ago i um had been working on creating a distribution channel um, that's solely distribution in studio um, and I'm proud to announce that I have effectively launched the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. Um, and the Lincoln Motion Picture Company is a company that started in 1916 and it closed in 1923. It was the first African-American production company ever uh, ran by Oscar Michaud, who was like the first black director. Um, when that company closed due to all of the issues with race films and um, you know just trying to find their place in Hollywood as a minority company, I reached out to the family and I got the charter and I relaunched the company. Um, right. So I've relaunched that company in my name. And so that's the distribution house. So Third Fathom is my production company where we make films um, based in the States. And then the fifth machine with Ernesto and his team in Ecuador are going to be our uh, Latino uh a Latino speaking um, international business. And we're working with a group right now in Nollywood out of Nigeria that we're going to bring under the uh, Lincoln Motion Picture uh, umbrella. So basically, I'm just trying to build relationships with with strong production companies who can galvanize their production. Um, if I say, hey, look, we can get a budget for this project, I need you to be able to complete that project and then bring it to Lincoln Motion so we can get it to distribution. And at this point, I can literally get a film anywhere in the world that we want because I have all the channels. Is there anything you don't do, guy? Like <laughs> I don't, I don't sleep. <laughs> I don't sleep enough. That's one thing I don't do. <laughs> that is wild. That is wild, and I think that's like one of the most important parts. You know, a lot of kids want to do what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them are completely uninspired, especially now with the pandemic that's happening, because everything is so shaky. Like the industry is shaking, um, and as an international student i think it's important to say man it feels good to know that there's someone out there recognizing talent elsewhere not just the states one of my favorite movies and i'm gonna i'm gonna do a two minute tangent. <laughs> go ahead <laughs> i'm ready when <laughs> when i was in brazil i went in to see a movie in the theater and i accidentally walked into the wrong uh screening mm -hmm. okay and people were speaking spanish it was called Helato Selvagens, which I think in, in English, I'm going to fact check this later, but it was, a, a, I think it's called um, Savage Story, something like mm -hmm. that, like rude translation. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was an anthology. It was a movie, but it was four episodes within a movie of this Argentinian comedy and like nice. crazy stuff. Like the mm -hmm. there's like a wedding and then the lady ends up like screwing the chef and all that. It's wild. Mm -hmm. Um and that was my introduction because back then all the movies I ever saw, I was like, what, 14 was just like, you know, United States. It was Tom Cruise, right. and Mission Impossible and I'm like, you know, Born Identity. That kind of <laughs> um, so it was the first time I was like, holy shit, they're not speaking English. Mm -hmm. 
And I got really into that whole idea. Um, oh, Tang is fact checking me. He thinks it's called Wild Tales. Tang? Yes. Okay, so it's a movie called Wild Tales. For all you guys listening, go check that thing out. It's hilarious. But that was my introduction to international mm -hmm. cinema. Um, and then obviously, as time moved on, Parasite came out, stormed the Oscars. Um, so I th do you think that the mentality now is changing, that people are actively seeking other countries, other creatives um, to give them a chance in the spotlight in the United States? Absolutely. Whenever Parasite won, it opened a huge door um, for all yeah. uh, foreign language speaking films to have a place in um, American culture. America's on a cultural shift where we're hopefully the sticks, but they're trying to become more culturally aware. Um, there's nothing wrong with a, a, a film that with subtitles. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with films without subtitles. Our films exactly. have always enjoyed the privilege of playing in all these different communities, but we shun those other communities for sharing their work. And so, you know, filmmakers and, and, and businessmen like myself have a, I'm aware of that need. I'm aware of that responsibility um, as a minority filmmaker to tell those very um, vast amount of stories. And so I'm, I've, we're spending a lot of effort in building bridges in the Latino community and the, you know, Nigerian community and the European markets, just in places where, they're not norm. It's not their stories are getting buried by their their border, and so we're hoping to to alleviate that because I really want to use my ability now and my distribution uh, efforts to build new filmmakers and get them on the stage with their you know first feature films and push them into the world to go out there and tell stories. I think a lot of times with me going to SCAD, being a little older, I was able to watch these young, um, you know, hungry filmmakers, and I'm looking at them and I'm like you have no idea where to start. You think that yeah. you have to run to Hollywood and become a PA and work your way up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. When the fact of the matter is, if you are a filmmaker, then you should be making films. What good is it gonna do you being a PA? Nothing, unless right. you wanna work that system, which I'm totally, if that's what you want, I support you. But I look at those that have the talent right now. They have the ability right now. They know how to make films now. I want to cultivate those filmmakers and I want to show them how to monetize themselves and how to get their work out into the, into the market and become a uh, living wage earning filmmaker. So, yes. No, that, that, look, I agree with you, man. And, and the other thing is you <laughs> mentioned that you're a filmmaker and you're a businessman. Yep. I'm going to say this to, to you because I know you're going to agree with me, but I'm also going to say it directly to the camera. If you are an artist, you have to be a business person as well. Like it doesn't yes. suffice just to be awesome and creative. If you want to make it into a business, mm -hmm. you have to know business. And there's a quote um, that I heard a long time ago, and I believe it was Simon Sinek, which is one of my mm -hmm. inspirations. You know, mm -hmm. Simon, if you're watching this, please come on the podcast. Um, <laughs> and he said that if you don't know people, you don't know business. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you as a dude, I, last time we talked and I saw you physically yeah. pre COVID-19, we were sitting in the Epcot looking room at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Atlanta, mm -hmm. talking about how to get um, music from my band, the two takes That's into right. the movie. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about you is that it was a business meeting, mm -hmm. but it didn't feel like one because right. you know how to talk. And I think that's oh, a value. You. Oh, dude, listen, I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to say a lot of good stuff about you today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> With, let, me, let me touch on this because you were the associate producer on HBO's Murder on a Sunday Morning, correct? Uh-huh, yeah. Um, which won an Academy Award mm -hmm. for the show. So you have a successful track record, man. You're, you're going mm -hmm. into this. Third Fathom Films is doing great. Hallowed mm -hmm. came out doing great. If you guys want to check out Hallowed, where, where can they see it? So Hollow Be That Name right now is pretty much everywhere. Uh, we had a rolling release where we started kind of in a few places and now we've rolled out. So we're on all, most of your VODs, digital downloads, so you can watch it on your Xbox, your PlayStation, wow. Vudu, um, any Microsoft uh, product, Google Play, YouTube TV, Vimeo On Demand. Um, it's on all the cable networks except Xfinity. That doesn't roll out until next week. But if you have um, DirecTV, ATT, all that stuff, you can catch it there. Uh, we will hit Netflix and Hulu uh, to closer to December because they're subscription based. They always come last. And then there's a sci-fi channel premiere that will happen at the beginning of Janu January for the first um, television debut of Hello Be Thy Name. Gotcha. And we're in the United Airlines, so I'm excited about that. So if you're on a flight, you can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys get on a plane, first of all, you're nuts. COVID-19 is still happening. But two, I know, right? <laughs> you can watch Taylor Richard's film and United Airlines, you said? Yeah. Dude, 
I if I go to Brazil for like a vacation, I'm booking United Airlines to watch this yeah. on a flight because that's crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, but I want to switch the focus a little bit to the movie, mm-hmm. okay? Because uh, first of all, horror flick. Yes. Right. My favorite genre, okay? Is all horror. right. Now you're from Louisiana, right? Mm-hmm. Originally. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned in an interview with CBS that the folklore of your home state really inspired you throughout your filmmaking. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit ab- about what kind of folklore inspired what um, for this movie. So what I will, before I say that, I'll say this. Um, for me as an artist, I, I like to stay close to what I know. Um, yeah. I'm not one of those people that like to create, like, you know, let me find something to be inspired about. I'm inspired by my, my life and my history and the people around me, and they keep me motivated always. And so Louisiana, it's kind of like a character for me. Um, tons of, of, of stories, tons of folklore. Um, he said, she said, or remember back then, or my great uncle told me this. And so right. Hallow B was kind of born from a story about the, the title character Kushma, which is a uh, demon, demigod, which whatever you want to think of them as, um, that would ride your back, um, causing sleep paralysis um, when you've misbehaved of sorts. And so I kind of took that premise and I built a world around it. And then I put myself in it through a couple of the characters and just kind of told that story. Um, so the simple story of Kushma causing you sleep paralysis, but all this stuff with the cave and uh, the wild fantasy in the world of uh, the Hallow Beat I Name uh, story. So it's it's big, so it was like one story that had like a kind of a simple beginning, and then you kind of elevated that. That's that's awesome, man. That there's actually a movie in Brazil. Um, so I'm not sure if you know too much about the film industry in Brazil, but we we have very dirty comedy. Um, we actually won the, the like the biggest guy uh, that actually converted and came to the states. Josef Agilia, he's the dude who did Robocop in like uh, twenty something, 2015, 2016. He was the dude who made Tropa de Lice. So the Elite Squad was like the gem of Brazil because it was excellent filmmaking. And there are excellent filmmakers in Brazil, don't get me wrong. Um, but they try to do a horror movie based on Brazilian folklore. Um, mm. So when I saw that you did it based on folklore from your home state, Louisiana, mm-hmm. I thought that was super interesting, man. And um, Yeah, so- a lot of people, they don't know that Louisiana, you know, I'm Creole, right? So uh, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, very heavy French background, very Haitian Mm -hmm. background, a lot of of Indian background. And so that's a, it's a unique blend. My experience growing up in Louisiana was unlike any other state in this country, uh, because it's like a a small French European town um, or, or city but stuck in the middle of America. And so that is, that's, it is just a making for such rich stories and um, things that people haven't heard of. And I felt like, you know, as I watched the horror genre unfold and, and you know, I've been watching horror films since the eighties, but watching it unfold, they were always missing the kings of horror, which reside in the stories in Louisiana, because we have, we have, uh, you know, everything from werewolf types of werewolves and uh, glowing uh, orbs, just a bunch of stuff, but things that are going to come out later. Cause I'm going to always keep myself um, in that, in that genre. Even if I go off and do other things, I'm always going to come back and tell a horror story every now and again. Oh yeah. There's some scary, there's some scary shit that comes out of Louisiana, man. I, yeah. I went once um, and I was just walking around the street and it, you actually, it, it is, it looks like, you're not in the States at, in some points when right. you're walking around the street. Because yep. the architecture, you yep. know, like the feeling. Um, yep. And I love it, man. I think that every artist at some point in their life should displace mm-hmm. themselves from where they're at and go somewhere that's very culturally... Um, uh, how do I say this? Culturally... Not important, but but very... Like a cultural spot, somewhere that's different. Yeah. Um, but that that's that's... For sure. And listen, I'm the type of guy, I'm scared of everything. Okay. I watch Hereditary. My Hereditary is one of my favorite movies. I don't know if you've seen Ari Aster. Um, one of my favorite movies. I shit myself every night. Every night. Every night. That movie just hit this chord with me, man. Um, and it, I want to jump on that. Ari Aster, you as an independent filmmaker as well, doing all the stuff you do, um, mm-hmm. even being in the industry for the past 10 years. But indie filmmakers face a lot of challenges, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, they're going to get through uh, roadblocks and everything like that. And I feel like some of the challenges they face is because they put themselves in this box of, well, for me to make an amazing movie, I need a big budget. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you were making your films, um, how much did the budget actually impact 
create creativity and do you think students need to shoot for large budgets mm -hmm. to get something done so this is just my high level opinion right i don't yeah. you know yeah. everybody has a everybody has a different you know walk and i'm not this is not me you know downing anyone's or judging anyone's opinion but i feel like with my first film um that film was you know very minimum budget you know yeah. less than less than a million dollars way less and it wasn't critically the most successful film but it definitely put me on a, on a on a track to be taken serious because here you have this little film and you're getting recognized by the black witch project people you're all over the theater circuit you're getting yeah. covered in hollywood reporter indywire this is what's happening all i did was pick a camera up galvanize a few people and we went shoot a movie you can't wait around for budgets you have to go get it done you have to create you a, a, a business plan shop it and get someone to give you some money and get to work because no one's going to invest in a person that's unwilling to invest in themselves and a lot of times independent filmmakers are people in the beginning don't understand is if you've never managed a budget for a film as a director you know for four or five six seven eight nine ten million dollars why do you think they're going to just give it to you right those people that you hear about that come out of you know film school and they go do these ten million dollar films they know someone number one they have uh, uh, they have connections and they, their network has opened that door for them that's not the case for most people that's an anomaly that's that's them you have to just get to work i know so many great filmmakers who right now are sitting around doing nothing because they feel like they don't have enough money when i'm when i say to them do you think the final project and Hallow B were my only movies I ever want to make? You don't think I have ideas for $20 million films? Of course I do. I have an ideology for a whole bunch of stuff, but I also know that there was a process. And for me to get into the business where I can now control my content, I have a, a, a slew of investors, all those things, because I proved, I have proven that I'm able to fundraise, come in under budget and return a profit. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. I have the text, the text, um, w, w, the W2s to prove my ability to raise money and to pay them back. And so that's the thing. You have to just get to work and pick up and make a film. You know, write a, write a film using the things you have for free. One location, two locations. If your story is good, if you've worked on your story and it's good, then the rest will do, do its part and you'll get yeah. where you're trying to go. Hi, just want to interrupt myself real quick to talk to you about our sponsor, Anchor FM, the distribution service for podcasts, which is putting us in front of you so you can check out all the secrets we're giving. Um, can you make money with it? Maybe, if there's a lot of you guys watching. So tell your friends, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell all the people who don't believe that you can be an artist to watch this, because maybe this can change their opinion. Either way, let's get back to the show. That, that's one of the things, man, because look, I'm not a <clears throat> film person i love film man right. i wish that i could like pick up a camera and be like oh yeah yeah the iso would touch this or whatever yeah. like great direction that, that's why i link up with tang all the time because whenever tang is talking about film I'm just like jesus christ it's a master class you know <laughs> um but w i did take a film class uh a couple of film classes and i saw that a lot of the people would overextend themselves to tell this narrative that needed four locations mm -hmm. 15 actors and all that and i was always of the mindset like look I want to see if I can make a movie in one room with two actors and mm -hmm. try to make it compelling. So do you feel like sometimes students, they think too big mm -hmm. uh, in their very first project? So what's I'm something sorry. you could, because I understand their fear that they're like, mm -hmm. I need to get in the industry. I need to do something amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but listen, man, the dude who made Paranormal Activity had what? $20,000 budget and it broke the industry yep. for like a year. Yeah. Black Witch. So, Ten thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. You, you gotta. Here's the thing: you have to make a decision as a as a first time filmmaker. Do you want to be critically acclaimed, or do you want to get a check? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, do you want to pay your bills and get a check and get yourself to a place where you can really make the film you want with more control, or do you want to wait, however long it may take, for you to get something that's going to be critically acclaimed? Mm -hmm. Wonderful if you can do a critically acclaimed film and you can raise the money you have the connections i say go for it but if you are taking an honest look at your life and you know you don't have the connections then you need to worry about getting your first project done so you can start having a more um aggressive conversation for the next project every project should be a base hit 
um, you, worrying about a grand slam on your first film is really just doing a disservice to what you could have um, and what you could accomplish in a smaller time if you just focus on a smaller film. Um, getting it out there, getting it to the market and say, hey, look, I'm a filmmaker. Here's my proof. Now, will you have a conversation with me about this other film that's, you know, six, seven million dollars because I did this little film and I was able to do this um, with nothing. Now, watch what I can do with something. You know, the people don't understand that. They focus so much on writing this high concept film and everybody wants to be the next Darren Aronofsky and have this amazing, yes, you can get there. But let me tell you something about Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry is not critically acclaimed, okay? And he doesn't have to be because guess what? He makes whatever he wants, however he wants to do it because he just got to work. Right. He got to work. And no matter what you feel about his projects, no matter how, if you don't watch them, you don't support them, that's okay. You don't have to because he has 50 million per film reason why he can do what he wants. i much rather have that type of power than be able to do one film every 10 years that's critically acclaimed. I just want to work and I want to make films. I want to be a great writer and do my part, but I want to keep moving forward. I'm working right now on my next project. As we speak, I just got an uh, option to script today from this amazing uh, filmmaker. It's a horror comedy. And um, he won a whole bunch of awards with this script. And for the first time, I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone and I'm going to, um, you know, issue a rewrite and then do some things with the script and then direct a script that comes from an industry professional. You have to be willing to try new things and do stuff. But these are opportunities that are afforded to me now because I shot a shitty film mm -hmm. i just got right. to work <laughs> <laughs> you know well, that, but that's the thing man it's it's uh, people see the end goal they don't really see mm -hmm. what's in front of them which is the whole right. you know fucking path to get to that point um yes look at ari aster yes look look at that dude you know he started off his films are fantastic don't get me wrong i i loved everything he's in so far but he started small and then he did hereditary yep right from Hereditary, I think Hereditary had like a $15 million budget, which when you're looking at like films that are coming out with giant distributors and all that, like $15 million, man, mm -hmm. is a lot of money, but it's also not a lot of money. All right. It's it's both a lot and not too much. Mm -hmm. But he nailed it. But he nailed it. He did. Right? And I think that was what, like, that was a, f a breath of fresh air in the horror genre community because it started getting very stale. You know? Yep. The Conjuring came out. The Conjuring was awesome. And then after that, everything kind of followed The Conjuring. And yep. then he came out with this family drama, mm -hmm. which just so happens to be one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. But mm -hmm. it is, in essence, a family drama. And actually, that's that's part of my next point I want to bring up with you. Because when I, I, whenever really good movies are made, and, and movies that really kind of think outside the box. Um, Hereditary was a little bit more conservative, but it did things right. Right. Um, in my opinion, right? My so humble, not filmmaking opinion. That's right. I mean, you're 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 a uh, paying fan, and you're exactly. right. Whatever, what you your feelings are the ones we look for. <laughs> so and that's yes. the thing. So he came out, did this amazing movie, came back in, hit another one with Midsummer. Um, mm -hmm. But if you really look at his films, and I think most films do this, right? Is if you're working with horror, which you you like horror as well. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like sometimes people try to scare you too much and don't pay mm -hmm. too close of attention to the characters in the story because Hereditary mm -hmm. is a horror film, yes, but it's a family drama. And if you right. took the horror element out of it, it would still work as a movie. I sure would. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you think students should focus on? So let's say there's a kid right now in school or just trying to learn uh, filmmaking on YouTube. What's a piece of advice <laughs> that you can give them when you're building a horror story? Mm-hmm what kind uh what should be more at the forefront should you worry more about the character should you worry about the jump scares should you worry about the theme when you started hallowed b what did you start with when it, when it comes to that so it's, it's an interesting question um so with my first film it was all about the jump scares it was found footage and it was about you know boo i got you you know type of situation <laughs> I which, is effective, which is effective. Which is effective. But I absolutely yes. did not want to do that with Hollow Be Thy Name. And so what I focused on, Hollow Be Thy when I wrote that film, I was thinking about society and politics. I'm being very honest. And I thought about the Bible. Those were the three things that I kind of sat around. And I said, now, how can I use some of the most controversial topics um, and make people interested in watching that 
um, and then scare them at the same time with situation, si situational elements. Um, I don't have jump scares in my film. Not, not, I think there's one. Um, but even that, it's not a gotcha moment. It's just, you know it's coming. Um, it's just you don't know when it's coming. And mm -hmm. so I use a lot of elemental buildup, a lot of music and soundscaping to tell the story. But there is a story. You know, we focus on, um, without giving away any spoilers, but there are central elements that are happening uh, with the B story. And there's controversial topics happening that could make some people who don't agree with that uncomfortable. And then there are situations where people who believe in the Bible, um, if you are really paying attention to all of those little nuggets that I put in there, um, it could make you ponder and think about a couple things. That's what I think people that are trying to get into the horror genre, if you want to be different, just like you saw with Get Out, using uh, societal references, things that we are all um, used to talking about, but in a political element, but jumping it into a horror film to kind of give you this cool dichotomy of two things happening at once where, yes, this is a horror film and I know I should be scared, but damn, that comment really made me feel some type of way or you kind of pissed me off or I sympathize with you and I understand where you're coming from. Um, there's a gay character in my film. I'm proud of that because you have never, on this level, you right, you know, my film is independent, but it has gone everywhere, right? There has been no gay characters anywhere. And with my first uh, film, there's a black female antagonist. That had never happened before. So mm -hmm. when you watch the final project, you know, this film has been out for a while. So if you haven't started, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. But there's a, a, a the, the black girl is the boogeyman. And oh, wow, we never saw that before. So I think if you're going to come to horror, you don't have to break the wheel. You can use all the tropes that we love because we watch horror films uh, because they deliver on a certain promise, right? We know that we're going to get scared. We know that we're going to get angry at some of the choices that the characters are making. But I think now is to raise, kind of like you're getting woke, right? right. Um, bringing some of those things together um, that will make us think, not just be fearful. And, and, and why that works so well is because it's a disarmament, right? You're disarming people when you start to put in those intellectual thoughts. Because once people start thinking about other, bam, here you are with something scary, and damn, you really got me. So that's how we do it. And I think that's the best advice I can offer. No, yeah, that, that's honestly, it's great advice, man. I, I think that's one of the things that um, a lot of students uh, struggle with, which is like, mm -hmm. you mentioned, like, you don't have to break the wheel. You right. don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are there are certain tropes in movie making and in, in horror mm -hmm. films and comedies that, that they are there because it works and we know right. it's effective. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like students need to keep in mind that for you to be an excellent filmmaker or an excellent game designer, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to you know invent an entirely new way of thinking. You just have mm -hmm. to do what you want to do well and execute mm -hmm. it properly that's that's properly and from your perspective right you know i think people don't trust themselves enough you know i was listening to jody foster she was talking about you know making her first couple of films and she was like i was so nervous because i didn't know i thought i had to know this i had to know that and i had to be this and be that you don't have to be anything but yourself because how they say no one can do you like you do you. So no one can bring to the table what I bring to the table and no one. And, and that's the same for anybody else out there. You're going to bring your unique experiences, your unique relationships, your unique, your unique point of view. You bring that to the table and you tell your story from that vantage point and you cannot be wrong. You need to write, you need to focus on and tell stories that you know. And then you need to tell them in fresh ways. That's how you bring a fresh perspective to any genre. It's your perspective. It is fresh because it's never been heard before. That's how you achieve that. People don't, they really don't trust themselves. Uh, right. I, I didn't trust myself. When I started a band trying to be a rock star and all mm -hmm. this crap, um, I didn't trust myself until I started seeing that like, oh shit, people actually, they're dancing to this stuff. And I, it, I feel yep. like it might be the same way with movies when people, mm -hmm. you're watching them watch yep. your film and you can see they're in that space yes you know? um, and i feel like that's the most important aspect uh of filmmaking mm -hmm. um now i do want to ask you this i want to throw a hypothetical at you okay okay <laughs> we're gonna completely shift gears here because i, I okay. want to see i'm gonna put you on your feet man here we go i'm ready <laughs> um, if you were the mayor of atlanta mm -hmm. all right what's one thing you would do to improve the indie film industry um in atlanta and in georgia but something that you see is not working. If you were the mayor, you would fix it, make it better for filmmakers. 
Um, if I was the mayor of Atlanta, I would probably create an incubator project similar to Tech Village um, that is churning out filmmakers. I would focus on the youth and building those relationships so that when they are going through the college process, my job would be starting in high school, right, with a strong incubator project, cultivating those minds, cultivating those internships, cultivating all of those opportunities. You know, I want your summer jobs to be in film. I want your, you know, your thought process. I want you to go to film school in Atlanta so that we can return them to actual professionals that live and breathe here. I think Atlanta has an opportunity to really cap, uh, capitalize on its power now in film. And I think the ability to keep them past the extinction of the tax credit that will surely come in some day is by building those bridges um, and pipelines from high school to the industry. That's how you you get people in the mindset of, I can be a grip or I can be a PA or I can be a filmmaker, but I can do it right here. Because obviously everyone's not going to be a director or a writer or a producer, but there are people out there that love doing makeup. There are people out there that love doing costume design. And it's cultivating all of those relationships um, through an incubator project in different places and, and, and honing those people to make them love and want to give back and stay in Atlanta. So that 10 years down the line, we have the type of talent pool that LA has. That's how you do it. So then when you're offering tax credit, you don't have to have conversations on why people are coming from California, filming here, and then leaving because you have a talent pool here. That's how I would do that. That's great, man, because yeah, you're right. It's it's about cultivating the talent that we have here, giving mm -hmm. the people yes. the uh, opportunity to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, and on the point of opportunity, you know, you and I, for example, uh, we have a multitude of opportunities because we're mm -hmm. able to, to, to navigate. Uh, you right. obviously, you're light years ahead of me, but hey, I'm running <laughs> behind you. You know, you are, you are doing great. <laughs> I can I can almost see the back of your head. So no, great. you're doing great. You know, I'm a fan <laughs> of yours. So <laughs> hey, man, thank you so much. But let me ask you this, because opportunity is something that just hit a bunch of kids. A mm -hmm. lot of them lost their opportunities. Right. Right. Because all of a sudden, myself included, you know, I graduated in March. I was set. I had a job waiting for me. It was going to be a cushy job. It's going to be great. And then a worldwide pandemic hits, which mm -hmm. tanks the economy, shuts down all the industries. Kids that had jobs at Rockstar, kids who had jobs in Hollywood, wherever they were going, a lot of those job offers got rescinded. Um, mm -hmm. So w w what is something that you can um, help us navigate when it comes to our mental health as an indie filmmaker during COVID times? W what's something mm -hmm. we should be doing so we don't lose our shit right now? You talk about a topic that I'm yelling at the top of my lungs for on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, I first of all want to say that I think what happened to all of the kids and everybody coming out of school on all levels was very unfair. Um, I think we could have responded better. Um, and I'm I, as an American, I feel uh, very embarrassed by what has happened and what is still happening um, in our response to the coronavirus. Now, having said that, I think what needs to happen now for those students, you can't wait around for this magic pill and this magic um, situation to fix itself. You guys are gonna have to redirect. You know, the one thing about, especially our uh, students who are, are coming from other countries, you guys already have showed a tenacity of wanting to have something different in your life to come all the way to America from your family. So you're made of strong stock. Right. Mm -hmm. You're the backbone of America. I, immigration immigrants are what made America what it is today. Right. So we know how tough you are. Take that ingenuity and that spirit. If you guys would like to vote to Mr. Uh, Taylor Richard as president <laughs> of the United States with the leading immigration policy, so sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> But you take that, you take that, you take that spirit, and you turn it into something entrepreneurial. You know, if, yes. if this time that you're quarantined, get online, learn something new, take the skills that you have, and start going out there and see who can use help. Volunteer, keep yourself moving because eventually this will pass. And if it doesn't move faster, there are other countries that are opening up. See what other opportunities you have out there for yourself. Dude, don't sit around and wait because I don't know what's going to happen um, with this presidency, with this the, the way things are going. I mean, even like a couple weeks ago, it's like, oh, if you're going online, you have to go back to your country. And I was like, I don't even understand what that means. That sounds very stupid, but that's what was said. So clearly, right now, America is being held hostage by a prima donna dictator. That's And I said it here. Um, but we have My to... Man. You know... <laughs> But what we have to do is we have to put politics aside and remember that we what made you take that step to go to college, take that step to come to America and use that strength 
and move yourself forward into the entrepreneurial way because there are still businesses that are going to need your services. There are still people who are going to need you to help them. Find those people. Put yourself on Fiverr. Put yourself in Udemy. Learn something new. Hone your skills. The time that you have now is the time for you to work on you so that when the when we are back up and running, you're good to go. You're ready. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's the best advice that you could ever give somebody. It's just mm -hmm. like, look, everyone is hurting right now. Yes. You know, I'm hurting right now, man. I had mm -hmm. stuff ready to go. I know friends in Brazil that were freaking out because they can't get back in the States mm. um, because Brazil is the second most impacted country in the world right, right. now with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, now, believe it or not, man, I have two last questions for you. I know we're running a little bit out of time here, but two, <laughs> two more questions for you. No, yeah, of course. Uh, and this is actually one that's not coming from me. I opened this up for people. I told everybody, hey, look, I am interviewing Taylor Richard. Send me your, send me your questions because I got them <laughs> for like 45 minutes. Come on. Um, and I got a question for you. I'm going to read it off right now. This is from Rachel. Um, and Rachel asks, do you usually work with the same people during production or does it change from project to project? So I do have a habit of working with uh, kind of like, uh, so I think of myself in a, as an auteur filmmaker. I'm very um, influenced by Quentin Tarantino. And I know it sounds cliche, but he is my favorite filmmaker. Um, One of mine too, yeah. But what I do is I tend to work with the same crew. I like to work with the same cast. Um, it, filmmaking is a relationship. Um, and when I build a relationship with crew people and I build a relationship with talent, um, I tend to bring some of them back and forth to the projects as I move forward. I'm a very loyal um, filmmaker. So if my you know grip is amazing or if my AD is amazing, then you're stuck with me. As long as I can have you, I will use you. Um, so anybody that wants to work with me, just know that it's a lifelong commitment. <laughs> hey, man. And that's good. It's it's security. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you get to know the person as you go, too. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, uh, let me ask you this then, um, because I know that a lot of people are going to listen to this. A lot of kids who, dude, I'm sure you inspired a hell of a ton of people. Um, I appreciate that. Just by talking to us. It's important for me to bring in people like yourself mm -hmm. so that students know, like, I mean, check out this guy's story. He did this, this and this. How can I do mm -hmm. the same thing? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so my last question for you, is there any way to, to does Third Fathom accept internships? Is there any mm -hmm. way that you can help mentor some if they have questions? Can they email you somewhere? How can we get some people to ask you questions? So listen, we have a great internship program. I think Tang was actually one of my interns one, uh, last qu quarter or quarter before, um, which he was very awesome. Uh, but we've had tons of interns, especially from SCAD. Um, I have a great relationship with SCAD, and um, they always send us some of the best, uh, the best of the best. Um, if you want to reach out to us, by all means, go on to thirdfathom.com and just send us a note and say, hey, I'm interested in being a film uh, uh, intern. And we have interns for all, not just film. So there's a... Uh, I, for my acquisition side and the commercial business side of what we do, I take people in the business, uh, you know, programs. Come and be an internship on the business side. Um, if you want to work on the production side, come and be an intern on the production side. If you're more into media and marketing, we have social media needs. Come be an intern there. Um, we are always looking to work with talented people. Like I told you, I, my goal is to create a pipeline um, for Atlanta to have um, talent shit films and everything done here going straight to distribution uh, bypassing hollywood altogether there you go well taylor i want to thank you again for coming in man talking directly to our creative film students out there everyone who's creative um and give us the story and what you did and how they can do it too um so thank well, you so much for joining it, man. me yeah you're very welcome and I, I really appreciate you guys having me and it's always humbling um to talk about myself this way and talk about the things that we're doing because i'm one of those people i just get to it and i focus on what i'm doing but it does feel good to stop and kind of recollect and reflect so thank you for the opportunity absolutely well hey listen uh, in the same way that you work with uh, a lot of the same people in your films i hope you know that we're gonna have to ask you to come back some other time absolutely now be ready thank you guys for hanging out with us this is one of my favorite episodes because i actually want to direct films can I do it? Probably not. I'll leave that shit up to Tang. He's behind the camera right now. But either way, check us out on social media at OKSO Media. Make sure to join us again next week for another awesome professional with awesome tips. This episode was shot by Hoka Studio. And just like before, everything is going to be fine, kids. Fucking relax. Drink some fucking tea. I'm stressed out as fuck, too, honestly. I just moved to an apartment. Dog ass to do the whole thing. All right, peace.